So you've decided to do Advent of Code this year and you've decided potentially to do it in Rust. That means you'll have 25 problems as you can see here. This is 2022's version. Each problem will have a part one and a part two for which you will get a gold star. So let's click on number one. And in this video, I wanna cover a project set up for each day for absolute beginners, people for whom this is the first time you're using Rust or you're using Advent of Code generally just to learn Rust in the first place. And then I'm gonna cover how I'm going to approach it this year, which is going to be quite a bit more complicated. So let's start off with a straightforward approach. You'll come across day one on December 1st. There will be some reading that you have to do to get into the problem, and then you'll get some input here. So we've got some test input, we've got certain answers for that test input, and we've got some answer for that input. So we've got a test case here, and then I've already submitted this answer for 2022, but you'll have a text input here to put your answer into. So how should you set up knowing that you're going to have to do two parts, knowing that part two is going to build on part one, and generally just getting a Rust setup going? What I'm going to suggest is creating a directory named advent of code or whatever you want to name it, going into that directory and then running cargo new for each day. So in this case, I'll do cargo new day 01, and that will create a binary application. If I open this in VS code, we can see our day one directory with a source directory and a main.rs inside of that. Make this a little bigger for you. So we've got day one source main, which is a binary. And then we've got a cargo toml with no dependencies in addition of Rust to use and the name of our package. If we CD into day one now and we run cargo run, cargo run will build and then run our application. So that's this code in main.rs. All this is doing is printing hello world out to the console, which we can see on the left here. Now you can start writing all of your code in main.rs, but I have one suggestion and that's to take this code in main.rs. We'll delete the main.rs file and we'll go into a folder called source bin and then part1.rs. So we've got a main function in source bin part1.rs. If we cargo run now, because we only have one binary, it will log out part one, and then do your work for part one in here. Once you're done with this, copy part one into the same directory and name it part two, and then work on part two. So here we'll say part two. So now when we do cargo run, you have the option of two different binaries, which Rust will tell you. So you cargo run bin part one and cargo run bin part two will run either part one or part two. So this is the code organization that I would suggest. And then every time you have a new day, just go to the root directory, go cargo new day two, and then you have day two starting off, same situation, create your part one and your part two bins and off to the races. I suggest doing it like this because if you're new to Rust, this will get you into the habit of creating new packages, potentially adding any dependencies you need into the cargo toml, and then working with your binary files without needing to worry about what you did in previous days. Now you may also want to write tests. So if you search for something simple like test Rust in Google, you'll get into the Rust programming language book for how to write tests. In this page, there's a code example not that far down, and we'll just take that in here and copy paste it. And now in day one directory, we run cargo test, and this will run our test. So in this case, we have one test that passed because two plus two does in fact equal four. So if we're going to test, obviously we need a function to test. And my suggestion here is going to be create some function called maybe part one or process or whatever you wanna call it. The input will take a string slice. It can also take a capital S string, doesn't really matter. And I usually just put to do in here because if we call the function, then it'll tell me that this is something that I still need to do. We'll make our result be part one with some input. And we'll also have to use this function in our binary. So there are still two issues here. In the top, we're using part one now with this file that doesn't exist. I highly suggest using include str here because this will be relative to the part one. So in here we can do input one.txt. This is an empty file for us right now. And if we save, you can see that Rust Analyzer gives us no longer a problem. So includester will bring this entire file and give it to us an input, which we then pass to part one. Part one gets the input and does something with it and returns some string and then debugs out the output. So in this case, let's say we did some work and I have to do as the string that we're passing back here. In our test module, so this is mod tests with a test macro on the function it works. So tests are a regular function in Rust annotated with the test attribute macro. And this is the module test. So it's a sub module of the current file. So to get access to the part one function, we'll type use super star and use super star just means that we're going up to the parent module, which is everything in these functions. And we are pulling those functions in so that we can use them inside of our tests. In this case, We've got part one, we're passing in some input and we're asserting that that is equal to four. Obviously, 
This is not a string. So if we have a string of four, then we can assert. What this lets us do is run the part one bin. So if we do cargo run bin part one, then we will see the output from line four, which is up here in our main function and is the string to do. And then at the same time, we can run cargo test and we can see that the test is failing because the string to do and the string of four aren't equal to each other. And we are saying that they should be. So this is the setup I would suggest for each of your binaries. Just take this, copy and paste it to each day. Don't worry about duplication. Don't worry about putting things in different modules, especially if this is just your first time using Rust. In the meantime, let's say we got this list and this is our test case. So I'll put that here. So now we're doing part one with an input of this test on the left. This is supposed to give some output. In this case, that's 24,000. So up here in part one, we would do some logic. In this case, I'm just gonna return 24,000 so we can see the test pass. And then we also need to make sure that the value that we wanna test against is the right number. So we run cargo test and our test pass. Obviously, I didn't do any of the work here. This is just an example of the setup and how you should work with it. So take the test input, put it into an actual test, test that against the expected output, run cargo test, to make sure that test pass. And then once it does, go down and grab your input. So get the puzzle input down here, take all of this from your puzzle input, put it into part one and save the part and save the part one input one file. So that's this file next to our part one.rs, which is getting included in our main. And now we can cargo run bin part one and in this case, it's 24,000 because that's hard coded, but this will allow you to both test against the expected output for the sample test and also run your actual code against the actual input and get the actual result that you need to give back to advent of code. And then usually part two is based on part one. So just take all of that code whenever you've written it and paste it into part two and then continue and do whatever you need to do. So same thing there, instead of input one, use input two, something like that. And just keep doing that every day. Don't worry about the code duplication. Just try to keep it as simple as possible. There are obviously many other ways that you can do this. There are people who have written advent of code specific libraries, things for parsing, things for just getting input in general. Feel free to use any of them that you want, but if you're just getting started, I would suggest keeping it as simple as possible. You're gonna have enough on your hands doing the puzzles and learning the language. So with that said, we'll move on and we'll take a look at how I'm going to do things this year. This is gonna be a broad overview of the repo that I have set up here because we're gonna go over each of the individual pieces for testing, for heat profiling and things like that in particular days when those things come up in the problems. So I've got quite a bit going on here. First of all, this is a workspace. So you can see I have a day one here up top. I also have a www. Those are both crates. If we look at my root cargo.toml, we can see that I have a workspace. I'm using Resolver 2, which is what you should be using if you're using a workspace these days. The members are the day for all of the numbers. So day slash star, and then also www. We'll cover www in a little bit. That's a website that I'm using to be a solver. I've also got a number of dependencies that I expect to use during Advent of Code this year. The only one that I haven't quite gotten a handle on is Tracy right now, but we'll cover that in a second. And then also in the root, I have a number of profiles. So for example, when I build Wasm at some point, we're gonna use this profile for building Wasm and making it nice and small. We're gonna use this profile whenever we're doing heat profiling with that. And we're gonna use this profile whenever we're generating flame graphs. So that leaves us with day one. For day one, we've got a cargo toml here, and it looks a lot like at the top, the one that we just looked at, but we've got these dependencies here and they are all pulling the versions from the workspace root. So in the root of the workspace, I've got a bunch of dependencies to find in each of the days I'm going to say, use this, pull the dependency from the root. Some of them are going to be regular dependencies. Some of them are dev dependencies. You can see that I've got benchmarks here as well as a feature for heap profile. I've got my input one and input two at the root here. And similar to what we talked about earlier, I've got a source bin part one and part two, but my part one and part two bins are quite a bit more complicated. You can see that they also use include stir to get at the input file that I also call my function something like process and then I'm printing the result out. Overall, I've got some features here that are behind feature flags for doing heat profiling and stuff like that, or for doing tracing, as well as custom error handling. So I've got a lib here that I'm using in both of those binaries. You can see right at the top, my library is named for the day. So day one, part one, the process function, and that's the function we're using down here. So if we look at lib, it's just three extra modules. So we've got two binaries and one library. Library defines custom error and the part one and part two modules. The custom error is just an error type. I decided that this year I wanna cover creating your own errors and handling errors in Rust in a little bit more depth. So I'm just setting up for that. We'll cover that more when it happens 
And then for the part one and part two libraries, I have the function that takes a string slice and returns a result of a string or the custom error type that we have with some to do's in here. And then I've got my tests set up in the same way that I had you set them up earlier. This is true for part one and part two. And these are library functions because we're not just using them in the binaries, but we're also using them in benchmarks. So all of this allows me to do something like just work day one, part one. And this runs a whole bunch of stuff for me. It'll do some compilations. It does a cargo check. It does some testing. It does a uh, cargo clippy. In this case, it's triggering on missing instrumentation on footer.rs, which is in www, which we'll cover later. In this case, I'm going to choose to exclude that. So you can see my just file here. And if I do just dash L, this is a bunch of tasks that I've defined that I can run. So the work task here takes a day and takes a part. And I use cargo watch to run check and then test and then lint. And then I benchmark and then I generate the flame graph. So here we had a lint for missing instrumentation, even though our tests passed. So that's this clippy tracing right here. This is checking to make sure that I have instrumentation on all of my functions, but it doesn't need to happen on www, which is where it found it. I'm having the linting run on everything all the time. So if we run this again, then just work day one, part one, it runs cargo check and test and lint and bench and flame graph. So we can see that the tests here are passing et cetera, et cetera. It does some compilation. Um, in this case, uh, I'm still targeting www. So in this case, I'll do cargo clippy on the package that we care about, which is gonna be day. And this is we day, and then we can pass through the day there. So I've let everything compile. And if we do just work day one, part one, you can see cargo watch, if I can scroll correctly. <laughs> You can see Cargo Watch, all of the stuff that we're running. Cargo Next Test, which is our test runner that I'm using for this. See our tests have passed for part one and part two. Clippy Tracing, Cargo Clippy, Cargo Bench, Cargo Flame Graph. And in this case, Cargo Flame Graph happens to be uh, failing, but I'll fix that. Each of these can be run individually. So if I list these out, I can do just Flame Graph Day 1 Part 1 and enter the password and it'll generate me a Flame Graph. Similarly, if I do just dat, Day one, part one, it'll generate me a heap profile for each of my programs. So this is considerably more complicated than what we went over earlier. But the point is that I can now run all of these things individually, see in the flame graph here. And obviously this is an uninteresting flame graph because there's nothing happening in our program right now. But we've also got this dat viewer and we can go to the dat viewer page and drop in our heat profile. And now we've got the heat profile here that we can look at and really so on and so forth. So we've got flame graphs, we've got benchmarks, we've got heat profiling, we've got a, a test runner, we've got custom errors, we've got tracing, and then I've got a couple of dependencies that are useful. On top of all of that, we've got a website. So if we go here and I zoom out a little bit because it's a little bit too zoomed in here, you can see that there's an advent of code here. There's a GitHub repo link. Each of the days are linked here and there's a footer. So if we click on day one, it'll be advent of code day one. And then you'll be able to put your input here and solve it and get the answer. I haven't built that part out yet, but this is a lepto site. So we're going to build everything in Rust. We're going to build our solutions in Rust. We're going to depend on those libraries to power a lepto site that uses an experimental islands feature and compiles to Wasm in the browser to put up a solver site on, I think, fly.io. So I know this is a lot. I'm not expecting you to understand everything about this right now. In the videos that I do for Advent of Code, I will be explaining each of the features that we're using in more depth when they come up. I'll be explaining what the er custom error types are and things like that. I'll be explaining what the benchmarks look like when we run them. You can see that every time we run the benchmark here, we see the new output. So if we still do just bench day one, part one, and we do that again, and again, and you can see it just keeps pumping out. So every time we make changes, we'll be able to see how that change is affected over time and whether we made positive changes or negative changes to the runtime. And those will be recorded for us to review in the videos. So that's everything that I have built out for Advent of Code this year. This day one is just gonna be effectively copied. I think I'm gonna use Cargo Generate on a template actually, but it'll be basically copy pasted for every day. So we'll have benchmarking, flame graphs, heat profiling, uh, linting, testing, etc., all ready to go. So I hope that was interesting for you. I hope that you are excited for Advent of Code and I will see you on December 1st. Have a great rest of your day.